The Our Father, the Pater Noster, uh, is the most well-known and beautiful prayer of the New Testament. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is called the model prayer. It models, it models how we should pray. This is called the uh, example prayer because it teaches us how to pray. Now, there's one unusual thing about what I read so far. The scripture says, our Father who art in heaven, actually Jesus said that. That's the only time in the gospels he ever uses the word, our Father, the words, our Father. He will say, my Father, your Father, or just Father. This is the only time when he's teaching us how to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, when we look around us to what's going on in human society, it's hard to see the will of God being carried forward, being accomplished. There are so many disturbing things. Human affairs are so messy because God gave us that special gift of choice, free will. And so we have to put up with one serious challenge to our understanding of God's will after another. It's hard to see God's will being accomplished for the world. How about God's will? Is that being accomplished for you? You're part of the group down on the earth, according to what we just read. God's will, therefore, applies to you. But you know that can be very difficult. There are so many crossroads in life. What are we going to do about a career? What are we going to do about our education? Uh, are we going to stay in school? What about matrimony? What about health issues? Where shall we live? Where shall we go to church? We often live in a fog when it comes to knowing God's will. But this verse seems to imply that we're going to know God's will. Not all of it, perhaps, but some of it. And we can add to this verse the scripture found in Isaiah. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk ye in it. Uh, wouldn't it really be nice if every time we were perplexed, about what course to follow, we heard words that came to us and said, walk in, walk this way, this is the way, walk ye in it. Augustine was a man who heard the words of God directing his life. Um, here's the verse in Isaiah. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk ye in it. And Augustine, who was perhaps the greatest theologian in the history of the church outside the scriptures, heard the voice of God. Here's how it happened. He had a very godly mother. And his mother was named Monica. And because of her influence on her son, uh, she became called Saint Monica. Have you ever been to Saint Monica? Probably several times a week. Santa Monica is named after Augustine's mother, Santa Monica. She tried to witness to her son, to tell her son that God had a plan for his life and that God had great expectations for him, but he was a very uh, dissolute young man, always drinking, carousing. In spite of all that, he got a job teaching rhetoric. Now, rhetoric was speech 
but more than speech, it included all the reasoning processes that go into uh, speaking clearly and persuasively. And he got word that there was a man in Milan. And this man in Milan was a, an outstanding uh, speaker. People came by the thousands. <coughs> they refused to leave the cathedral. And they listened to him and lives were being changed. So he went to hear this, this teacher named Ambrose. He went to hear this man in the year 386. Ambrose made such a, a, an, a, an impression on Augustine that he just, he just felt like God was really calling him to a change. And uh, he had had a very dissolute life. And uh, one day, he was in a garden behind his house. He was in that garden, and as he did whatever he had in mind there, he heard a sing-song voice of a young girl. And this young girl was singing, This is the way, walk ye in it. This is the way, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. She wasn't just saying it, she was singing it. And he tried to remember if he had ever heard uh, a child childhood song like that and he couldn't so he wondered if this was a message to him and he wondered if there was something around that he ought to pick up and read he went in the house and right there was a guess what a bible he picked it up and began to read now this is the first scripture he came to Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. He just opened his Bible in response to that song. And all of a sudden there was a scripture which just leaped off the page and into his heart. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in excess and lust. And so he made his decision to become a Christian. He went back to Milan, and uh, Ambrose was still preaching. He preached there for many years, and he gave his heart to the Lord in the company of Ambrose, and in the year 387, he was baptized. He heard a voice. Remember the words of Isaiah, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. He heard that voice. And he became the greatest theologian in the history of the church for well over a thousand years. His classic book, The City of God, is extremely well known even today. He had, his heart had been reached because of the voice of a child coming over the garden wall. Have you ever heard a voice from the Lord? You know, I have talked with a number of people who tell me that they have. They have heard a voice. But we do have to admit that it's not usual to hear the voice. We may find ourselves in a fog, wondering and worrying about going to the right or going to the left. We don't hear that voice but we can receive an impression. And that's what I wanna talk with you about today. The impression that you can receive from the Holy Spirit, leading you into embracing God's plan for your life, leading you into surrendering your heart to the Holy Spirit so you can be led just as Augustine was led. But before we look at some scriptures, which teach us how to receive, how to receive God's will for us. Uh, we need to know what Jesus had to say on this subject. 
And I'm mentioning that because I have met a number of people who had very, uh, very strange understandings of what the will of God was for them. They had a dynamic impression, or they had a, they heard a voice, and, and, and it just seemed to me that maybe uh, they, should, they should study and pray some more. Can we be certain that we can know the will of God? Now listen to this from Mark 3, verse 31 to 34. Then Jesus, mother and brothers, arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here. That refers to the people in the circle sitting around him. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother and sister and brother. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Did you ever want to belong to Jesus' biological family? Not just the family of God, which is kind of a general concept, you know. Jesus said, anyone who wants to do the Father's will is my mother and my brother and my sisters. Friends, if you determine in your heart that above everything else, you want to do the will of God as you understand it. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit forward to accomplish God's purposes for your life and for others. You can be sure that God will start speaking to your heart. Now, one time uh, I, I, was, uh, I was doing call porter work in San Jose, California. Any of you ever know San Jose? You probably do. Okay. And uh, I, I, I did that. I, I chose to do call porter work with a group of young men from Pacific Union College. They had rented a house, and we sold Mark Bible and Steps to Christ, and that raised money so we could buy our one supper a day, you know, next door. The rest of the meals were pretty much catch as catch can. <clears throat> And I remember very clearly that I was in the town of Campbell, which is a suburb of San Jose. And I was just about to cross the street, and an impression came over me. It was so strong, I could hardly breathe. And I remember looking up in the sky to the east, and a certain train of thought started to go through my mind. You know, you've been a student at PUC for two years, and uh, although your major was history, all you have to do is take one summer uh, for the ministerial, co ministerial course and uh, two more years for the ministerial course, you'll finish up a double major. And here's why that appealed to me. As we went door to door, knocking on doors, believe me, the call porters have the hardest job on planet Earth. And as we went knocking one door after another, <clears throat> sometimes people invited me in. They said, what church are you? I said, well, we're Seventh-day Adventists. Tell us about Seventh-day Adventists. I had marvelous experiences all summer with people who wanted to know about the Seventh-day Adventist church. And, I, and with that background, uh, I, and, and here came this overwhelming impression. You know, you know the ministry. Your father's a pastor. You seem to have some fruit already out there in, in the neighborhoods of Campbell and uh, you enjoy public speaking, how about you're stepping forward, this impression spoke to me, you're stepping forward and taking the ministry up at Pacific Union College. I did not hear a voice, but I had this overwhelming impression. I could hardly breathe. 
Have you ever had an impression like that? So strong you could hardly breathe. Well, it would be so nice for all of us if when we come to those crossroads, those cul-de-sacs in life, we have that little voice saying, don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right, go straight ahead. If we have that, it gives you an assurance in your life that God's will is being honored by your life and God's will is being accomplished in your life. <clears throat> now, in order to know God's will, obviously here, uh, Jesus said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother and sister and brother. My food, he said in another verse, is to do the will of my father. So Jesus believed without a doubt that God could make his plan known to all of his disciples. In order for you and me to discover the plan, to discover some of the will, God's will for us, to fill in the blanks of our lives, we need to have the major instrument. Now, by instrument, I'm thinking of a telescope, you know, you can see all the way to heaven and see what God's will is, it's revealed there. Or um, some other scientific instrument, or a musical instrument. We need to have one great instrument, a major instrument, and some minor instrument. And if we're clear on those, I predict that you're going to be able to tap into God's will for your life more and more. The major instrument is found in John 7, 16. Can you turn there with me? That was read in our scripture this morning. This is the major instrument to discover the leading of God. John 7, 16. Well, let's see here. Did I get it right? They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Well, let me look at John 6, 17. Well, what Jesus said is, if you desire to do God's will, you will know of the doctrine. In other words, if your desire is to know God's will and to do it, to know God's will and to do it, then God will open up a vision for you of what his will is in your life. That was what happened to me standing there on the street corner of San Jose. I wanted to do God's will. And, and this, this impression was so great. And I just, I just went with it. I went back to the call porter house where all the boys were sleeping on sleeping bags on the floor. I told them all about this. And, and some of them said, oh, great. And others said, you? <laughs> you know, you're never going to get 100% on certain things. So God will reveal himself to you, but you have to be willing to accomplish that will, to do it. Think of the rich young ruler. He said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And the scripture says that he went away sad and grieving. See? He was willing to do most of the will of God, but not all of it if it cost him his personal wealth. 
Go and sell your, your, all you possess and give to the poor. And he just couldn't do it. So the great instrument is simply this. In advance of having the Lord show you the right path, are you willing to do God's will before you know God's will? See? That's the great instrument. That's, that's the great instrument. Now we have some minor instruments to know God's will. And the first one is a scripture you know well, found in Psalms 119.11. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know that one? Now what that scripture means is that someone who desires to know God's will <clears throat> needs to be well acquainted with their Bibles because God's word is never in conflict with God's will. God's will will never be in conflict with God's word. The more scripture you know, the more the Holy Spirit will bring a verse to your mind, which can help you in times of real stress when you're really concerned about what's going on and what you ought to do. Now, there was a pastor that I knew who, who was a single man, and... Um, he was sitting in his office one day, and a nice lady came in. I want to tell you, she was a nice lady. She was a blonde. We don't have anything against blondes, do we, gentlemen? She was a blonde, and she had such a wonderful manner about her. And she came into his office, and she said, Well, Pastor Tom, I've been hearing about you all the way in Canada. And I've been hearing that you don't have a wife. <laughs> you know, I think I could make a very nice wife for you. And she was very attractive. And I mean, she was just a lovely person. And right then and there on the spot, Pastor Tom decided to marry her. Can you say amen to that? Yes. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> oh. See, he was willing to do God's will. And boy, it really helps when somebody comes to you and has a nice smile, you know, and tell you, tell you, tells you what it is. But we have to be careful about impressions. There was another man. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit was leading Augustine. But there was another man who wasn't really led. <clears throat> and... Uh, he decided that he had to know God's will, so he, he was going to put his finger on a text in the Bible. Just open it up like Augustine did and put his finger on a text. And so uh, that's what he did. And he opened the Bible, he put his finger on the text, and it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> he said, that can't be. That can't be what the Lord has in mind for me. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to close the Bible and open the Bible and put my finger on another scripture. He opened the Bible. He put his finger on another scripture, and it said, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> he said, I can't let it rest at this. This is terrible. <laughs> the third time, he opened his Bible, and he put a finger on the scripture, and he looked at the scripture, he was very apprehensive by this time, and it said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> we have to be careful about some scriptures. The meaning is obvious. But we need to get a lot of scriptures on a subject before we base a life decision on, on the word. We need to be clear that... Uh, it's, it's, it's not a mistranslation, or we're not misinterpreting it, uh, it. So our first minor instrument is you've got to get into the Word. There are so many verses which, if you're looking for guidance, will just jump out at you. Now we're ready for the second minor instrument. This is in Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now that's a 
That's a, a piece of advice that many people have trouble with because really in their heart, they want to marry that girl. Love is blind, and they don't want to hear anything about taking years to get to know her better. No. So you have to be clear that when you get a scripture that seems to give you good advice, take that scripture to your godly friends. Your godly friends. That verse said, where there's no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Don't make any life decision, just all on your own. See? Talk to people. Get some counsel. And, and then you may have to do that several times before you're sure that your feet are on the right track. Now, here's the third minor instrument. In Isaiah 118, the scripture says, Come now and let us what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. God's will is never contrary to common sense. You may feel like you put your finger on a text and it just shouts out at you. But you're going to have to study around it. And you're going to have to take it to your pastor, take it to some of your elders, Sabbath school teachers, and say, you know, I'm kind of in a dilemma here. This scripture seems to be saying something to me. Does it say the same thing to you that it says to me? You might need to use the Benjamin Franklin method of coming to a decision based on the scriptures. Here's what Franklin did. Took a piece of paper and they divided it down the center. <clears throat> Half of it was um, reasons for. The other half was reasons against. And then he started in, thinking of all the reasons for. And then he went back to all the reasons against. And then he sat down and he looked at that, at that, at the results. And he usually had answered his question about what path to follow. God's will is never contrary to common sense. Now, there's a fourth minor instrument that we can use to determine God's will. And it's related to the one that we just looked at. You need to pray about it. If you understand that God's will is never unreasonable, see, Come now and let us reason together. God's will is never unreasonable. It will always drink deeply of common sense. And so you have your reasons for and your reasons against why you're thinking about something. And you go to somebody at church that you feel is a godly believer. Okay? A godly believer. You show that person your, your, uh, your list and then the two of you pray about it. And then you pray some more about it. Here's how one pastor liked to pray. When he needed God's guidance in his life, he needed to know the will. So he made a list on one side of the paper. And on the other side of the paper, he left that blank. Now on the first side, he said, what is the next step in my career? What's the next step in my career? And then he did something so important. He said, I got quiet and I listened. I want to tell you that there are times if you're quiet and still, the answer to a problem that perplexes you will just kind of float up to the surface of your mind. See? Well, on the second page, he had another, another question. What is the next step in my ministry? And the next page, what is the next step for my family? Next step, what is the next step for my marriage? What is the next step in my education? What is the next step in my finances? You see? He took everything that came to his mind, he put it down on paper, and then he checked that with godly friends to make sure that his heart was not leading him astray. Now I want to tell you a story this morning 
best story I have about how God impresses people to do certain things. We were in Hong Kong. I say we. It was a group of about 16 Adventist pastors. We were there because Adventist World Radio had received some donations. And they came up with a wonderful plan. They said, our pastors don't know enough about what Adventist World Radio is doing around the world. So let's take the pastor's on the journey. If they can help with the airfare, good. If they can't, okay. And so <clears throat> there we were in Hong Kong on a Sabbath. And I've been to Hong Kong twice. It's, it's a tremendous, tremendous town, you know. And uh, the pastor got up and he said, I want to tell you a story today about how I was led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, half of the church was Filipino uh, maids and cooks and babysitters. The other half of the church were a lot of people from overseas. Very interesting congregation, you know, and a very full church. Well, I was there with 16 pastors. Let me tell you, we've heard a lot of sermons. This was the best sermon I ever heard in my life. Now, here's what he said. <clears throat> he said, my wife and I were back in the States. Uh, and we were reading the newspaper on a Friday. And my wife noticed a little story in the paper. And this story said that a young couple, it named the street where they live, another part of town, that a young couple had somehow left their baby in the car on a very hot day. And by the time they realized that the baby's life was in jeopardy, it was too late. And it said in the article that a lot of, a lot of, uh, Neighbors had said things. It said a lot of reporters had gone by, but the questions that they asked that made it into print were harsh questions. We can understand that. Well, the pastor's mind was on his sermon the next day. He was going to teach a Sabbath school lesson and then te preach the sermon. His wife said, well, I have good news for you. I already called the head elder, and he's going to take your Sabbath school class. Oh, really? He said, yes. She said, I feel impressed that you should go and visit that young couple. He said, well, I only have their street. Go at any one. Go anyway, she said. Maybe the Lord will lead you. Next morning, he got up early. <clears throat> he got in his car, and he started driving towards where that street was across town. Remember? All the reasons why this was a waste of his time kept coming up. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't want to hear from him, and uh, what would he say? And before he left, his wife and he had written out a special card, so they wouldn't go to the door empty-handed. But he was making excuses, and he got to a corner, and he said, well, uh, I just don't think I'm going to find where they live. And he looked up, and there on the street sign across the street was the name of the street that the young couple lived on. He had been led to it, just driving in the general direction. So he said, well, okay, Lord. He turned the corner, started driving down the street, and there was a man standing on the curb, an older man, just standing on the curb. And uh, the pastor thought he looked like a watcher. Do you have any watchers in your neighborhood? <laughs> they like to look through the blinds, you know, see who's coming and who's going. Maybe keep track of some uh, license plate numbers. And this man looked like a watcher. So 
The pastor stopped and he said, you know, I, I know this is probably asking way too much, but do you remember a young couple who lived on this street and uh, something terrible happened and their baby perished? Do you remember that? The man said, well, of course, he said, their apartment was right across the street. And he pointed at it like it was up second floor, you know, right across the street. And uh, so before going across the street, the pastor said, well, now, how has the neighborhood responded to this young couple whose baby passed? And uh, the man said, well, I tell you, he said, the, the, the people have been pretty rough. Pretty rough. So the pastor walked across the street. He walked up the stairs, the second floor, the third floor. He started up there and worked his way down. He went through, he knocked on every door, and nobody was home. So he said to himself, I've done my part. I've done all I can do. And he was just about to turn and go when he saw another door. So he knocked on it, and the door opened. And there was a young man there. And uh, so the pastor said, well, we, I'm here because my wife and I prayed about this and we felt compelled to find a young couple who uh, lost their baby. And the young man said, I'm the husband that lost the baby. And the pastor said, well, uh, you know, we, we brought a card for you. And the man said, let me have the card. So he took the card, and he walked in the house. He said, follow me. He walked through the house and came to a hallway. And the man said, honey, can you come out? And there was a closed door at the end of the hallway, and the wife came out, the mother of the poor little baby that was lost. She came out. The husband said, this man has a, come to us to give us a sympathy card for the loss of our baby. And his wife said, well, that'll be the first one. And so they began to read it. It said something like this. It said, God has not promised us sunshine, but he has promised us that he will walk with us through the storm. They started crying. They said, come on in. The wife went in the back room and she came back with a stack of, of uh, you know, baby books, uh, scrapbooks. And she said, our, our, um, our collection ended. Uh, the day our baby died. Well, the pastor said, what happened? What happened? <clears throat> well, she said, we were new to the city. And uh, every morning, I would take our little girl who had just passed one. I would take her to the, uh, to the uh, babysitter. And I'd leave her there. And then my husband would head for work, and, and so would I, after dropping our baby off. But on this particular day, our routine got changed. Because my husband had just gotten a new job. And this was the first day of his new job. And he was so excited. They stayed awake all night thinking about the new house that they would get with the extra bedroom for the baby. They thought about it all night. And when the morning came, they slept in. And what happened then was they really scrambled. They really scrambled. And the wife said, uh, Listen, can you take the baby to the babysitter on your way to the new job? 
Uh, I just don't have time. I've got to get to work. I think you can make it. They agreed on that. So the wife drove off, and the young man took the baby, put the baby in the back seat, and um, uh, headed for the babysitter, but on the way, see, on the way, he was so excited that he forgot about the babysitter. Now, let me tell you something. I could really... I could really relate to this sermon <laughs> because when I pastored Thousand Oaks Church, there were two services, and uh, my, my, our daughters, two little daughters, would go to the early service, and then Sabbath school, their mom would take them home, see? So uh, we went to the early service and, and uh, then Sabbath school, and uh, my oldest daughter was tired and she went to sleep. <laughs> and so after the service, the uh, deacon said, I'll lock up. And uh, so we, I said, thank you, thank you. And I ran, jumped in the car, and went home. <laughs> and my wife said, uh, where's Carrie? <laughs> Ooh, now you talk about embarrassing. Where's Carrie? Wow. I ran back. <coughs> there she was, still sleeping on the pew. No worse for the wear. Now, this gentleman, he, he went, and it was lunchtime. And so uh, he, he had his lunch, and, uh, and as he was digging through his lunch to get good things to eat, he thought about, well, I just wonder what the baby's doing now. And he froze. And he threw himself out of the chair there in the cafeteria. And he threw himself down the stairs over to his car. And it was too late. And so this young couple, they sat there and they said, we want you to see how much we loved our baby. And they went through every picture and every every. A memento in their baby books, in their albums. They were there for hours, and the pastor forgot about the sermon back at the church. <laughs> Turned out his wife preached the sermon and might have done a better job. But anyway, and the young couple, they said, you cannot believe how much we appreciate your kindness. See? So they were given an impression as to what to do. But because of all of the, all of the activities and the mixed up schedule, he forgot just one thing, that the baby was in the back of his car. When that pastor finished that story, Every pastor, I think there were like 18 pastors on this trip, every pastor lined up in a row at the door, and he came right down the row, and we all shook his hand because he was the pastor. He was the pastor that had been led by the Holy Spirit. He wasn't even that enthusiastic about it, but his wife had enthusiasm, enthusiasm enough for him. He was the pastor, and every pastor told him that was the best sermon ever. That was the best story ever. God bless you for going back and finding that young couple. Would you do something like that? Would I do something like that? You see, God wants us to have our instruments in hand, the great instrument, the lesser instruments, and the last instrument I'm going to message Mem uh, mention is prayer. Pray about it and pray some more. Uh, this one pastor made a list. What is the next step in my career, in my ministry, family, marriage, education, finances, every page. And then he said he got quiet. He would get quiet and listen for the Spirit. You got to do that. You got to get quiet and listen for the Holy Spirit. Friends, God wants us to be co-workers, to be knights who are going to ride out in the world and be led by the Holy Spirit to slay the dragons. Is that what you want to do? I pray that that will be true for you. 
Listen for the voice of the Spirit. Read your scripture. Pray about it. Determine in your heart you're going to do whatever it is that God shows you. You need to do. And when you do that, answers will come. And the fog will lift.